Um, so today's schedule, distilling information. Uh, purposely a little nebulous there because we're going to talk about that. NGSS, what that stands for and how that pertains to us. Uh, on behalf and curriculum and the SLTER activities, which is the primary topic for today. Uh, and we will be doing two activities here. We will be doing the plant ID activity. That's what he at least, I, it's already started. That's <laughs> what Haley's and Adley running around trying to put together. And we are going to go out and we're going to do the effects of fire on the prairie or the Holbert plots activity. At least part of it. We can't do the whole thing because there's just simply not enough plants growing for us to count because it is a, it's counting growing plants. And if you don't have any plants out there growing, there's not just a whole lot to count. But we will go and walk through at least the, the concept so you have an idea. Keeping in mind that no one leads an activity until they've really gone with somebody else and observed it. Okay. You're, you're, no one's ever going to be in charge of an activity until they feel, except for Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Currently Jeff got put in charge of an activity. <laughs> until you feel comfortable doing it. Okay. Uh, so point one, distilling information. We've gotten quite a bit of information over the last two days on climate change and on fire, fire ecology. And it, it, it literally woke me up at about 1 o'clock and I tossed and turned and thought about it. And it's like, you know, about 80 to 90 percent of the information that you got is not going to be information that you give to the children. Those, those were two days of of adult education rather than education or guidelines on, on what you would give to visiting school groups. Since we're here to address visiting school groups, you need to understand what information to give to the children. So on climate change, distilling that down, climate change is one of our drivers for research. It's a driver for research. And we're seeing this manifested as different experiments that address drought. Because with, the, with higher energy, more heat in the atmosphere <coughs> is increasing the amount of transpiration. We're getting or water removed from the plants and we're getting larger periods of time between rain events. You don't have to say it like that. You could just say the climate change models are predicting that we're going to have higher incidences of drought. And so a lot <coughs> of our research is looking, is simulating drought and seeing how the prairie responds to that. Why are we doing this here? Well, that goes back to the fact that 96% of the original tall grass prairie is gone. So there's not a whole lot of tall grass prairie left to do research on. There is one biological station present in a tall grass prairie. Guess where it is? Yeah. <laughs> it's here. So if, if, if any ecologist wants to know how climate change affects the tall grass prairie, that research needs to be done here. Okay, so that's, that's the point that we drive home. Okay, driver for research. Looking at effects of, and you're going to see lots of drought research, <coughs> effects of drought on the water. <coughs> <aspect. coughs> and I think you can say that without terrorizing the kids. You can just say, you know, we're, we're looking to see how the prairie responds to drought because climate change may lead to that. So fire, a couple of distillation points for fire. Fire is absolutely essential for the management and maintenance of a prairie. Essential for management and maintenance of a prairie. Sometimes you just have to 
cut it down to the point. How often do we need to burn? And it's a very common question. Okay. You need to burn at least every three years. need to burn at least every three years. What happens if you don't burn at least every three years? The woody plant. Okay. To keep woodies from establishing. Side note on that. Woodies. You can use that up until the first semester of sixth grade. Yes. Second, <laughs> I'm absolutely yes. serious. Yes. Second semester of sixth grade on, if you use the word woodies, they're gonna start they're gonna start giggling. Yes. <laughs> do you do you need me to tell you why? No. No, 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 no of course not. <laughs> okay. If you need me to tell you why, we'll you, just take them into the bison. We will <laughs> It is a euphemism for our male situation. <laughs> and situation. And they figure that out the second semester of sixth grade. They're still sweet the first semester of sixth grade. I don't know what happens at Christmas break, but things happen. <laughs> and so the second semester of sixth grade on, do not use the word woodies. Use the word or the phrase in wooded vegetation shrubs and trees. Okay. I'm serious. Okay. Happy place. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm thinking that those who have older brothers in sixth grade probably are not Right. Older. That doesn't yeah. help. Yeah. Okay. So, fire needs to happen at least every three years to keep the woodies or wooded vegetation at bay. Burning every year You might as well say that if you're out there talking to sixth grade and middle school people and they start laughing, you realize you just said something. You just said something. <laughs> you just said something. You know what it is, you know. <laughs> My wife has so many stories. <laughs> if, if you burn every year, you're going to be encouraging the growth of these grasses here. Burning every year encourages And you've been hearing this phrase, the warm season grasses. You don't want us to say C4 grasses. Don't want to say what? I did it. He's <laughs> jumping ahead on. Yeah. Okay. Warm season grasses are these <clears throat> grasses in the corner. They are big blue snow. Big blue snow, the tallest grass. They are switchgrass. They are Indian grass. Don't worry about identifying these right now because you'll learn this in the autumn. Indian grass is the one that you will need to use a capital letter on. The others can be lowercase. Little blue stem, also seen up on the mantle. Might be an easier way. And then number five, side oats grandma. These are the dominant grasses of the tall grass prairie. They are also referred to, like I said, the warm season grasses because they thrive under warm temperatures. They will start, they will start growing in the spring. The blue stems will look bluish in the spring and early summer. The vegetation looks bluish and then they will start looking reddish and then finally goldish. They change color. What does grandma mean? Grandma refers to graminoid, which is grass-like okay. plant. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just referring to grass. Okay. What's your grandma? Be grandma. 
There's a, there's a series of them, most of them are not short <laughs> I can never remember if it's gamma or gamma. Every well, we have because we have both. both. Yes, we have both. Yes, the gamma is the great have, big one. Yeah. Okay. We have a lot to cover today. Yes, we have both. So, so we there have. Is a gamma. That's we why talked it's about, confused. and that's where it gets confusing. That may not be the Eastern gamma graphs, and then we have cytos gamma, and this is one where if you're talking to kids, you have to say we're not talking about your grandma. Yeah. We are talking about grandma and spell it for them. Okay. So gamma is what? It's a big one, you just said. Correct. That is what Joe Gelroth yesterday talked about, the ice cream for cattle. You may have heard that phrase. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is very tasty grass that cattle will eat. And the eastern gamma grass is a cool season grass. The cool season grasses are already starting to grow. The cool season grasses grow and put out their seed heads in May and June. The warm season grasses grow and put out their seed heads in July, August, and September. They like the heat, and these guys will dominate. They will literally keep other plants from growing because they are there. As Brad mentioned, these are also referred to as the C4 plants or C4 grasses. And uh, Patrick referred to that several times yesterday. And the C4 grasses refers to a type of photosynthesis in which the plants have an enzyme that binds the carbon dioxide. So remember, you have to have carbon dioxide for what process? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. So if you can actually get carbon dioxide picked up, it's, it's, it's a lot like going to the grocery store and having your groceries delivered to your car. You know, you put in your order. <laughs> Has anyone tried that? No, Regardless, no. It, it's a lot grass. like that. They have an enzyme that brings the carbon dioxide to the chloroplast, okay, which is really nice. You get it delivered more efficiently, and if you get efficient deliver of carbon dioxide, you're going to get what level of photosynthesis? Which equals dominance. C3, in contrast, C3 is your typical plain old run-of-the-mill photosynthesis. The cool season grasses utilize the regular old C3 level of photosynthesis. They don't have that fancy enzyme. It's more efficient. The C3 is more efficient in the cool, and the C4 is more efficient in the hot. The reasoning for that is because when the plant is getting carbon dioxide, the pores in the leaf are open. That's how the plants get carbon dioxide. When the pores are open, it also leaves them susceptible to water loss, mm -hmm. which is transpiration, evaporation. When it's hot, it does the plant good to be able to efficiently get your carbon dioxide as quickly as possible without having to have your pores open because if it's hot, you're going to be losing a lot of water. So it is, it's, a, it's a survival mechanism for hot weather. And these guys do really well when it's OK to lose water. These guys do really well when it's hot and dry. And they can function really well without losing too much water. Okay. That's so just a simple one. Okay. Where do wheat and corn fall into that? Corn's yeah. over there? Yeah. Corn's warm and wheat. C3. We, yeah, so wheat's a C3. Corn, yeah. Well, you know, you have your winter wheat. Yeah, yeah. right. Your winter wheat. Okay. All right. Um, another thing to distill from fire. If you are burning every year, these guys are enjoying it. Who is not enjoying an annual burn? What, what group of plants do not Forbes. do well? Forbes. Forbes. So burning every year results in low diversity of plants. Burning every three years, and if you were to include raising in that, that is going to increase your diversity of plants. Why? Because grazing helps to control the dominant plants because they're getting eaten. 
And grazers also have a really handy way of fertilizing little spots with urine and, and feces, which plants love. And they've got a nice little source of nitrogen. So between controlling the dominance and fertilizing the ground, grazing helps to increase other plants' survival equals diversity. Okay. That make a little more sense? Or just filling it down. Can you shorten that as like just, just shorten what you just said about that real quick? You bet. Okay. Thank you. Annual burn leads to five dominant grasses. Biennial or three-year burn, either one, I'm not saying that they're interchangeable, but either one is going to lead to more fours. Okay. Okay. Yes. Biennial or three-year burn plus grazing is going to lead to even more fours and more overall plant diversity. If you're talking to kids, yeah. you are going to need to explain what diversity means. And you can use that in a way of uh, like race diversity. Yeah. Or yeah. what you look like. Because that's where they've heard the word before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where they've heard the word before. So put it in context of what, what's familiar to them. And that's really for anything. Put it in context with what's familiar to them. So with the annual burn, even if they're grazing animals, they're, uh, they'll have dominant grasses, I guess. Even with grazing animals, you're going to have a more, a higher preponderance of the dominant grasses. That's the rest of the twin grass. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay? Yeah. Can I erase this? No. Because <laughs> I was still listening, I'm Take sorry. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. And there's no way to keep Woody's from establishing. Burning every year will keep Woody's from establishing. Right. But it comes at a trade-off to plant diversity. I was making a joke. Oh, sorry. <laughs> was that a was that a <laughs> it was too early in the morning. It was too early in the morning. Oh. 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 <laughs> Junior high school. Seriously? <laughs> I am not editing that out. That's, 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 that's Wait, you're going to be the highlight of the video, though. You, you know it's on video. You know it's on video. It's the back of your head, so <laughs> yeah, don't just forget. Yeah. Especially now, I'm sort of sinking into the floor. So. That's all right. I'll edit that out. All right. Next. You brought it up, Jill. So. I totally did. <laughs> I totally did. It had to be addressed. <laughs> okay. NGSS stands for Next Generation Science Standards. So, show of hands, who has heard of this before? <laughs> Okay, so you've heard of science standards, but not next generation science standards. So they simply are concepts that students are expected to be exposed to and to have mastery over for each grade. Could, could I add something to that? You are welcome to. They're beyond concepts, they're also skills. So it's important to realize that they're in the context of content and skills. So, so this, this affects us 
because Kansas is participating in the Next Generation Science Standards Program oh, and indeed awesome. helped to compose it. So you guys helped to make those? Kansans did. Yeah, Kansans. Kansans did. And so what we do is we looked at the Next Generation Science Standards at the, the concepts and the skills and we saw what things could be addressed, awesome. what STEM standards could be addressed when students come to Contemporary and participate in different activities. Mm -hmm. So different activities offer different science standards. Can I ask you, who created this and how does it relate to core curriculum with or whatever that's had so much controversy? Do you want to address that, Brad? Okay, you're talking about the mathematics core curriculum versus this. This is the GSS. This is the science version of that. I thought core curriculum, yeah. for, um, maybe yeah, that was also a separate part of the core that was on language. But the fact is, this is our version here. And if you actually get into GSS, you'll find it's much more complicated document than they ever had before. But one of the things it gets into is actually linking out to both math and the uh, uh, language common core. Common Core is what I was searching for. Right, and it, it created a lot of controversy because, well, frankly, the, the math uh, education community is way, way behind where the science community is, and, and they're still tugging at each other. So what happens is they develop this great curriculum, but they didn't develop enough professional development for people to be able to deliver it. And what it amounts to is students finding their way in math. And so they find a number of different solutions to the same problem. It's driving parents crazy because the kids are, are, are being told, this is how you do addition. And the parents said, that's not how you do addition. That's not how I learned to do it. And so uh, it's, it's a great deal, but it's, I think that's going to be a, more of a problem. This one's still sticking around, but I do want you to understand that it's, it's about student Product. So the stuff that you do out here is something they could take back that, you know, that would be cool. Or something they could produce back at their school, which I think this SFLTER is going to really play into really well. Okay. So it really helps the teachers to know what concepts, what experiences, what, what activities, what knowledge the students are going to be exposed to. And so we have all of those outlined for each activity and they're available on our website. Okay. So you can do, the teachers can go on and say, if you're going to do uh, the stream chemistry, these are the next generation science standards. And in fact, it's in your binder for stream chemistry. But the nature trail, the nature trail can offer just about all of the science standards, depending on how the guide addresses them. And that's what these are. The experienced docents already have these. These are the science standards that can, that can be addressed on the nature trail for each grade. So each grade, so it's color-coded. So this is kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, on and on. And then the middle schoolers are silver, and the high schoolers got gold. Mm -hmm. okay. So are you primarily staying within the uh, life science standards? Or not necessarily. Not, good. Okay. That's what not necessarily. Yep. So for example, and you guys will get these. Okay. Okay. And they fit in your pocket. Fit in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Laminated fit in your pocket. So for example, what did you teach, Kathy? Fifth? What? Um here in Manhattan for Okay, fourth grade science standards. Plants have internal and external structures that help them survive. Talk about roots, stems, and leaves. Then talk about thorns, spines, prickles, tendrils, and flowers. Animals have specific anatomy that helps them survive. How are mammals different from birds and reptiles? What does each group possess that aids them in their survival? Animals can see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. Find evidence of animals responding to their environment. Note how erosion has shaped the Flint Hills. Find evidence of erosion and or fossils that indicate changes over large stretches of time. Find evidence of different kinds of erosion, wind, water, and ice. How does erosion affect different kinds of life? Yeah. And would you care as a manager of the prairie, or would you, 
Because a lot of them are going in with the idea that we just love bison, they're so cool. And they, they think that the bison are, once they're here, they're here forever, having a happy little life out on the prairie. They're happy for a while. It's like a zoo for them. Yeah. 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 So why 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 not? This is the first time they've ever been probably been to a place that's managed quite like this. You won't tell them to be cold and all that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Sure. Yeah. But I think that's a great opportunity to talk about research. You know, what does it mean when we say this is a research station? And that that harkens back to the idea that there's more than one way to skin a cat. You don't. Not everyone's doing this activity the same way. In fact, it's impossible for everybody to do it the same way, and it shouldn't be done the same way. When we talk about misconceptions or prior conceptions, one thing that students don't quite grasp is an organism as big as a bison might not live as long as what we do in a normal environment. I mean, even if they had a perfect environment, they won't live as long as us. They'll understand dogs, but they won't understand that. So, yeah, you know, I can still remember the first time I understood that deer didn't live much more in about three or four years. You know, eight years was huge. So, bats live 35 years. Really? That, that one also surprised me because I, <laughs> I've handled bats that were 20 years old and I knew because I had the bands. <laughs> I've listened to professors joke about the fact that the, there's a student holding a bat that's way older than the student. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they're amazed by that. Cool. Mm. I there's, have there's, no idea about that. Yeah. There's, there's lots of different ways to approach this and all of them are going to really be mm -hmm. valuable. As long as the kids are are happy, having fun, asking questions, asking questions. Mm -hmm. if they're cold and miserable and no one's engaging them, then it becomes unpleasant. Mm -hmm. But Jeff and Patty can talk, and Ma'am can talk about leading groups, you know, under interesting situations, whether it's pouring rain mm -hmm. or <laughs> lightning down. Yeah, yeah, thunder and lightning all in the distance. So, yeah, we get you out of there in that That's case. Well, so. <laughs> in that case, we get you out of there. You know, Jill, too, uh, the often, it, and especially as you get into seventh, eighth, or higher, um, you think you've got to, you know what you're doing and what you're going to do out there, and you find out that they're taking you a whole different direction. And from, that's perfectly fine. From what you had planned, and you just got to go with their flow. Oh, wow. and keep it interesting for them, for what they're interested in. Um, because it, I, I've been surprised with the older ones, how knowledgeable of mm. lots of different things and how they look at things differently than, than what you might expect them to look at. Or you can't go in with, this is my curriculum, what I'm going to do when I'm out there on that trail. I'm going to cover these four science standards. And all of a sudden, you get to the end, and you haven't even been there yet. <laughs> yeah. But they, but you've been there. That they've been happy, and, and, you, and, you, and, and they've been. done something. They've really learned. That's and that's a wonderful message. It, really, what it comes down <clears> to, <throat> if, if the kids had a great time, then then it's been good. How many of them come back? Oh, lots of them. Yeah. So it depends on the it depends on the school. Yeah. They can get a different experience every time. Maybe. And one thing that I really encourage the teachers to do, if we can, is to have them come out during different seasons so they can see how the prairie changes. Yeah. So if they could come out in the spring and then come out again in the autumn, and then that's a whole different lesson. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is it different from what you remember the first time? What's changed? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a completely different place. All right, any other questions about Next Generation Science Standards? Uh, you will all be receiving a set of these to have with you. Uh, some of you will be getting them tomorrow. It takes, you know, they're all laminated, and it, it takes a little while to put these together. So if you don't get one tomorrow, you'll be getting them soon. Next. Okay, so I think everybody received a copy of the book. Chris did, so Chris needs a copy of the book. So, and we didn't really get a chance to talk about this because you just came in after the bison lived and saw that you had a book. And like, oh, isn't that nice? Well, the, the book is, is, 
intended to tie children into science. And I think I told most of you, and you know this, that, that this is actually an LTER system product. So each of the 28 LTERs will eventually have their own children's book. And with the same intention, to have a compelling story that revolves around the, the site to draw kids into the science. And what we are hoping to do, and this is geared toward a fourth grade audience, and fourth graders that come here get a book. They get a free book. Wow. Yeah. The National Science Foundation supplied me with 2,000 books. So I have 2,000 books oh stored here, and I would love for them to not be here. <coughs> so we give them to the, to the schools. And this becomes way more valuable to the students if there's some type of curriculum that's built around this. And so I'm going to need your help in developing curriculum. Now I've got some, if you guys are amenable to it, I've got some things already available online. Let me show you where they are. Jill, I remember you saying kind of in passing one time that fourth grade is the right age to target. Uh, fourth grade is a wonderful age. So why do you say that? They do not have preconceived notions and opinions about things. They have not they have not settled into a certain thought. And so they they're still they're they're sweet, open. they're innocent, they're open, and they're they're curious. They, they, haven't, curious. The, they haven't switched to the social side of the world, and they're still curious about the real world. And the other thing is they're in a transition zone between primary grades and upper grades. And so a lot of the curriculum in fourth grade used to be kind of an introduction into the upper grades and a kind of a review of what you were doing below. And so it, my, my wife loved fourth grade. She thought it was the coolest grade of all the teachers. I spent 25 of my 35 years with go. those wonderful little people. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth graders. Fourth graders are fourth graders. They, they are absolutely delightful. They love the world. They do. And they, and they still love that adult person who's willing to, to help them discover. But they're old enough. They're old enough to, to tie stuff. their shoes and blow their nose and zip their zippers and yeah. do all those things. That, and read. And they soak things. That's it. Soak that's the key. They can read they to read. learn. They're not still learning. So it's, 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 like, it's, like it's, it's like the middle of a tennis racket. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the sweet spot. And they, they're good. They love it. They love this information. Thank you, Haley. So, over on the right hand side, if you can see that, it says teachers, libraries, and schools with a free copy of the Autumn Calf. Update curricula is now available. <coughs> for the autumn calf, have you ever wondered what a bison weighs? So we have some worksheets that can be done in the classroom using real data. So here's some questions. First, there's a, a background of the bison um, saying that they roam all over Ponza Prairie. Out here on the prairie, bison calves are usually born in the spring in April or May and are fed their mother's milk until they start eating grass at around six months of age. Yeah, so there's some information. The bison at Conza Prairie have large open pasture of 2,500 acres. They feed on grass and other prairie plants and are not fed extra grass or hay, not even in the winter. Every year at the end of October, the bison at Conza Prairie are rounded up and weighed on a special scale. The weight of the bison calves can give scientists some information. So, during what month of the year do most of the bison calves start to eat grass for the first time? So go at six months of age, right? Yeah, yeah. So May, June, July, August, September, October. Okay. How much time do new bison calves have to eat grass before their weight <coughs> in October? Not much. Uh, not much. <laughs> Maybe a month. Mm -hmm. Who do you think would weigh more? A bison cow, an adult female, or a bison bull, an adult male? So that that gets them thinking and guessing. And I'm, I'm insinuating that there's a difference, right? Mm -hmm. So that may be new. They might be thinking, oh, there's a difference. And, and the, the males weigh more. Do you think all the bison calves weigh the same in October? 
So there's another concept. They might think, oh, they all, they all weigh the same. They're the same age, right? No, they're not. And in general, the, the female calves weigh less than the male calves. So find the weight for the lightest calf. So there's some data. Mm -hmm. And this is actual data. And with their ear tags. Those are connected to their mothers? Are those calves? Those are their, their, their ear tags. Right, but do you know who their mother was? In that? Jeff would know. Jeff. I know. I didn't know if you put it in the chart. I don't know, yeah. No, in your table. I didn't know if you put it in your table. No, okay. don't, don't know who their mother is. Okay. The fourth grade should be able to average the weight. There it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So find the weight of the lightest calf, now find the weight for the heaviest calf. What's the difference between their weights? Why, why do you think there's so much variation in calf weights? Mm -hmm. yeah, this is good stuff, John. <coughs> Thank you. Very good. Think about the kinds of things that would make a calf weigh less. Okay. As I remember from when we were out in the uh, bison enclosure area, Jeff commented that the way they associate calves with mothers is to see how they pair up after coming through the mm -hmm. shoot. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I, um, so apparently it's hard to see uh, out in the field. Are they observing them out in the field? Mm -hmm. Jeff and, is. Jeff makes so notes. He's, he's noting who's nursing who. But until you have Roundup, you have a bunch of calves without any ear tags. So you yeah. have no way to identify them until they've right. gone okay. through their first Roundup. Mm -hmm. okay. Then you can put a nut, you can put a face or a name to a face. Basically. So here's an explanation. I don't know. Jeff was such a bison whisperer, I think he can probably recognize it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he needs any ear tags. <laughs> so here's the ear tags. So we have some other activities. So we have these bison figures. They can be laminated, <coughs> and we can put we indicate that bison are <coughs> called calves, or cows, and adult female bison are called cows, and the adult bison males are called bulls. Mm. Bison weight ranges. Calf weighs between 150 to 380 pounds. A cow, notice, look at that, a big calf is about the same weight as a small cow. A cow weighs between 400 to 1,100 pounds, and bulls from 1,200 to 2,000 pounds. Make photocopies of the bison outlines. Right, one of the provided bison weights in the center of each, pass them out to your students. So each, each kid gets a bison with a, with a weight on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Each kid gets their bison and you ask them, do you mm -hmm. think your bison that you have is a calf, or is it a cow, or is it a bull? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which weights do you think are calves, cows, or bulls? Have the students stand up and put their bison in order, so have the kids get in order by the weights of their bison that they're holding. We don't do this, do we? I think you should. No. This is for in class. This is in their classroom. In their classroom. <laughs> so the lowest weight is on the left side and the highest weight is on the right side. Then ask them, is it surprising how different the weights are in a herd? Is there a difference between the smallest calf's weight and the largest bull? Or what is the difference <laughs> between the smallest calf's and the largest bull's weight? Is it surprising how widely different the weights can be in one species? More challenging, have the students refer to their bison, give them a table of bison weights, and ask them to find their bison to determine the gender, aha, and then their bison's ear tag number and their bison's age. Mm -hmm. So if you've got, we'll go up here, mm -hmm. you've got 360 pounds, who do you have? Male calf. How old is your male calf now? Oh, 45, oh, almost caught up with 18. So it's 40 in 2000? No, 2010. Boom. How old so is that male calf now? Eight years. Eight years. Yeah, it's not a calf anymore. If you see her still. It's probably not here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah probably not. So, <laughs> So if you do this before they come, they can say, okay, my calf was not, was orange 18. I'm going to see if he's still out there. <laughs> yeah. 
Because these are all real animals. I didn't make any of this up. It's all real animals. So they're out there. And they can look for them. <clears throat> but I can tell you that um, mm -hmm. these guys are they are all gone. I think all of our bulls are orange now. Mm -hmm. How new is this out there now, Jill? When does the teachers are actually using this now? It is yeah. available. Okay. And so I need to find ways to get it to them other than just putting it up here on the website. Mm -hmm. Have you had oh, some? I, have I you think had that's a perfect yet? way. To I, I've never seen anybody use it. Yeah. Pardon me? Have you had anybody use it yet? That you know? I have sent it to people. I physically printed it out and sent it to people, but I don't know if they've used it and I've gotten it. I haven't gotten any feedback. So you haven't done any pre or post assessment on whether or not? Not on this. Did you have plans to do that? Well, this is one thing that, that I'm, yeah, here we go. one thing that I want to do is I want to develop an entire curriculum kit with more than just this. Mm -hmm with things that address like the flowers and phenology. Well, and data nuggets, certainly. Um, but the development of a curriculum kit that could be used anywhere in the world, not just I here. mean, what you've got there is something similar to this at a fourth it's grade It's very level. much, yeah, yeah. But just getting it out there. And then assessing it to see if it's if worthwhile for fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you make teachers aware that this opportunity exists? Okay. Okay. Well, they could do mean, median, and mode on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you introduced that at fourth grade, mean, median, and mode? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And so, then box plots, maybe? You start those yet? Or, mm -hmm. or scatter plots or any kind of graphing? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. lots of graphing. Right. It said Dot there was plots, an maybe. activity in there to, uh, what, there was an, a graph activity mm -hmm. that came along mm -hmm. in your thing that was a, yeah. Um, so, so when the teacher calls in and says they want to do a bison tour, mm -hmm. so would you let them I, know that this was out there I would and that's that's in preparation? And it couldn't doesn't necessarily just have to be fourth graders, right? And I and I need to maybe look at development of, of activities like this for younger too, and mm -hmm. development of activities that involve art too. Because mm -hmm. even with younger kids. You could do whole class activities, not necessarily as individualized as you would make it for upper level kids, mm -hmm. where a teacher would do a guided instruction just to expose them to all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, some of the ordering of numbers. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of So maybe the mean, 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 be a okay. starting at work. They might have talked about it a little bit in third grade. Good stuff. Thank you. Well, I'm excited. So, yeah, dot plot works really good with this because you just have a number line and you just put dots over the places. So, that would also help do your other. Yeah. So, here's another one. We got we give them the data for bias and weights from 2010 to 2015, so they get to see what happens over time with the same bison. Then they get the average of the bison of the female calves, average of the male calves. What is the difference between the average male or female calf weight and the average male calf weight? Okay. Why do you think there's a difference? How many calves disappeared from the data after their first year? Before you move off of that one, go ahead. I, I think you you hit on something that is more important than I think most of us realize. How many are missing? So when we started the Monarch Watch curriculum. I can't tell you how many people had, I mean, almost breakdowns regarding the death of their butterflies. The, our students today, do those city kids you're talking about, do not actually have that day-to-day -day experience with life and death and the cycle of life. I can tell you that raising butterflies turned out to be one of the most important things they could ever do because they lost some of it while they were raising them. And, you know, it's an animal as opposed to a plant. They don't seem to care about the plant. <laughs> but when you start doing this business about asking what happened to the missing calf, this cute little calf that you've got a little, oh. you know, the, oh, yeah. the, or like what we saw with the still yeah, ones, right? Uh, it's, it's something that's really important. And it's one of those things you're, you were talking about where you're, it's a huge difference when you're rural kids and you're city kids. Right, the rural kids sure. understand that much earlier. And there's more than one reason 
for why a calf would disappear mm -hmm. from the data. And this, this gets a discussion started. Mm -hmm. and, nope. and Jeff insinuated this, but I don't know if he caught it. Okay, so you're thinking immediately death, right? Well, sometimes they hide mm -hmm. and they don't come in. And then they suddenly show up the year after that. And you're like, so let me show you what the data looks like, because this is just the questions. The butterflies were more of a second grade, so it's butterflies. Okay. Jeff made the comment that that stillborn calf would disappear pretty quickly. Yes. Uh, and uh, that probably there are stillbirths that we never know about. Uh, definitely, yes. But so anyhow, you get, uh, you see that a, a, a cow doesn't have a calf with her and you say she didn't uh, produce a calf this year but maybe she did and it was stillborn mm -hmm. uh, or died you know before you got it into the roundup well and so then that, that begs the other question yeah. why why was there a stillbirth what exactly. what reasons yeah. do you think there could be I guess it's very unlikely we'd ever see that again. It sounded like that was a pretty weird <laughs> thing that we saw but the kids aren't going to be out there early enough for that probably no, I but they. I don't think it's appropriate for grade level. Not uh, the grade no. level we're talking about. Wouldn't now. be a topic to bring up, but what yeah. you saw? You saw. You have to address it. Yeah. They they see things. They see mating. They see. Oh things. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So here's here's the data. The data was on a separate sheet, and so you get the ear tags and the the actual data, and you can see how their weights change. And you you obviously have to address what happened to these calves in 2012. And, they, and I give the answers, by the way. I give the answers. So the teachers aren't left trying to just guess what the answers are. And, they, and what do you think the answers are? What happened to these four? They were sold. They were sold. And why were they sold? Too big. Too many. The little ones, the little ones are sold, and we have we have more than we need for the for the healthy dynamics of the population. And so when Jeff is making the decision of who gets sold, he's not picking the biggest ones oh. to sell. He's picking the smallest ones. Six out of four was quite a bit bigger. Right. But <coughs> I guess I thought the older ones were sold off. Too. So that's yeah. what I was thinking. The bigger. older cow. There's there. So there's there's calf. there's four four cat well but it's not a calf anymore. Oh yeah. So it's it's now a two year old adult cow, and it, if they're small, they're going to get sold because you only need so many of them. They'll be sold to somebody that's running a herd for bison meat or whatever. Or whatever I guess. They're they're sold for whatever reason. Look at that. And there's some really interesting. <coughs> I was telling Jeff when I was putting this together, I said, I could just sit and look at these numbers for days. And he said, I do. It's, it's fascinating because you see stories. You see stories. Well, that 38 doubled, it more than doubled its weight in one year. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think what, again, back to what you're talking about, talking to kids, you just said you see stories. Everything with interacting with the kids is stories. It's, don't try to just give them facts and hope they make the story up themselves. Start them on a story that it causes anticipation, which causes them to want to figure out the next answer. Kids love stories. They love stories. And if you can personalize it, they love that too. Because suddenly you're excited. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it gives them permission to be excited too. Like this is, if you say, this is so cool, they're like, yes, it is. So, Jill, you, you were talking about weight being a criteria for selling them. Yes. And and, and help me out here because I'm not I'm not understanding that. So, like, if number seventeen, yes, it was a weight issue. Yes. In in 2011, he's heavier than the next guy. Who yes. Has to stay. So what? Well, there's more than just weight, obviously. This would be a Jeff question because okay. some sometimes he has intangibles, maybe. Um, and these are bulls. He's not going to keep very many. He's not gonna, but, but she's wondering yeah. why he was sold here and this guy was not. Yeah. You said they pay some attention to genetic diversity. Right. So yeah, so there's, there's more to it than just no. <coughs> that. That's going to be your foundation. Okay. But then he's going to go from there with other things. 
But this guy, he was still, you know, and we would have to ask him. Because he would say, well, well, 38, look at how much bigger 38 got. Well, 17 was older too, right? Nope. They're all the same all the age. Same, same age. Zero, zero. In 2010. Oh, yeah. They're all the same age. They, that just indicates their sequence in getting their tags. Does he make the decision of which ones are sold, or does somebody, come, a buyer, come in here and say, I want this nope, one, this one? Nope. Oh, okay. No, that's, that's Jeff. They're, they're also sold as one lot. They're sold in a group. And so if, you, if you're buying the two-year-old calves, two-year-old male, well, they'd be called two-year-old bulls, um, you get that entire lot. So do they go to Plumley or? You know, that's they go to whomever puts in the best bid. Puts in the best bid. But how far would you haul them? We do not haul them. Well, they, they come and get them. Right. They, they can come from North Dakota. Really? North Dakota. North Dakota. North Dakota. Wow. Yeah. wow. How do they make that trip? So whoever whoever puts in the highest bid and is willing to come get them gets them. How in the world can you manage it? You know, it's one thing to fill up a stock trailer with, sure. with cattle, but uh, these things are pretty unruly and they're big. There's there's a there's a, a, a cattle or no a bison rancher in South Dakota and you may have heard of him Dan O'Brien maybe some of you and he started a bison ranch because he wanted to reconnect back with the prairie mm -hmm. and it, it, it was a philosophical and a a economic decision for him he he went away from the cattle and he went to bison and he's got this amazing book it's called buffalo for the brokenhearted and it's not referring to his broken heart it's referring to the name of his ranch for buffalo for the broken heart his ranch is called the broken heart ranch and he he he's an amazing writer and he writes about trailering in his first load of bison and what that experience was like and so dan o'brien is your guy and so what's cool about him, let me show you his website. The Turner Ranch down in Madison Lodge has got a fairly large bison herd, right? The oh yeah. He trailered in there when he bought that place. Well, he, 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 has, he has about 10 big rents. He's bought all the rooms. Okay, so here's Dan O'Brien's place. Here. Oh, oh, Wild cool. Idea Buffalo Company. There's his oh. place. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. beautiful. Oh, this is... Just east wow. of <laughs> kind of looks like here. Just yeah. east of the, of the Black Hills, and so what he. What well, about the place they did some of the dances before? It is not. Yeah, yeah, this was his place was after. After okay. Yeah, this is this not. This is in East. North Dakota. This is in South Dakota. This is right between the What's Badlands and the Black Hills, and you can buy, you can buy bison, but he's an amazing author. There he is. I've dedicated my life to preserving and restoring the Great Plain grassland. Do they burn it? Do they burn it? Do they burn it? Do they burn up there? Yes. Does he do ecotourism on his ranch? He does not. Hmm. Some of the ranches down in Barber County do that now, so that's one. This is, you see how <laughs> scraggly yes. they get it. Yeah. No. Is, is, is that him? That's him. him. Cool. Have you met him, too? I have. Mm -hmm. well, I have, actually. He's got one cool dog out here. <laughs> yeah. He is. <laughs> okay, do you guys know Michael Forsberg? No. Michael Forsberg. Oh. <laughs> He's another one that can make me cry. Let me show you him. These two are friends, and they collaborated on a book. And it just kills me to read it. 
So Michael Forsberg lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, is he the one that also does National Geo He does. I, I he does I cranes. Yeah. He's big into cranes. Yeah. No. There we go. That picture is down in the Ooh. Ad Astra Cafe, Strong mm -hmm. City. Yep. So this this is he has this place. This is Michael <laughs> Forsberg is a photographer. <laughs> oh, that. See that that could be here on our group here. Yes, and he has come here and he has photographed him. I've got a Michael Forsberg photo in my office, and he's another friend. But these two collaborated on a book. On the Great Plains, and it's just oh, wow. devastating. Mm. What's that book called? Mm. The Great Plains. Let me show you. Mm. Was this in our curriculum? It is now. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Great Plains, America's Lingering Wild, and there's a Forsberg picture. Oh, that's gorgeous. With Essays by Dan O'Brien. Oh, you hear those two? I've had to literally get up and leave. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you been to see the cranes? I have. Yeah. That'll make you cry too. Oh my God. Where are they at? Here in. This Nebraska. is the Platte River, North Platte, Nebraska. Oh. And they're there now. And they're there now. We did go there. We're not going today. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, we went for the eclipse. Yes. It was gorgeous. Yes. The, the 400,000 cranes getting up in the morning yeah. is amazing. And then having them come in for hours in the evening. You can do that at Kovira here uh, in the fall. Okay. I saw them in New Mexico once. Well, I'm yeah, a the small group. Yeah. A small group. Yeah. Or smaller, much smaller than. Yeah. than uh, Excellent. I'm glad you gave us a, so you just so, cost me some money. <laughs> me too. He is amazing. Those two together. Those two together. So do you have any of those prints on your wall? Uh, well, and there was one behind me, but we moved them around. That's why I went and looked. Okay, so this one, that's Kanza. Uh -huh. uh, <gasps> almost looks oh like one gosh. of his prints. But that's you know how Just he took his that? Name how he took that? Yeah, what kind of lens? Because it's almost impossible to get a whole arch rainbow with one shot. Those I do not know what, what. And it looks at dusk, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, which way, if it's at dusk, which way is he facing? <laughs> East, east, east. east. Oh, it's facing east. Oh, it's got the light on. Yeah. Is, we've got some on Butterfly Hill like that during, Boy, that during the June nice. watch when we've had some storms. Mm -hmm. The reason is, is the rainbow, is, mm -hmm. the sun is always behind the rainbow. Do you want to go to the bookstore There's today? Nice. Mm -hmm. I've got free books. His, yeah. his photography, he, he really has a love affair with the prairie. And yeah, Lincoln, he can pop down here or pop up to the mm -hmm. Niagara River. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I like the black and white. You like the black and white? Brad, you just said something interesting. So you said if you're seeing a rainbow, the sun has to be behind you? Yep. Hmm. Think about that. I am. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I may be able to tell when a photograph is fake. <laughs> Do you see many fox out here? Uh, no. Okay. no. I see fox in my neighborhood, but I don't see them out here. I was trying to think. The only place I've seen them, I've seen them is on the other side of Butterfly Hill down in that little pond there. There are bobcats out there. Excellent. Are they more likely to run away from you? I like this picture like. so much. Okay. That one right there just drives me nuts. This, his, his wife is the photographer. Mm -hmm. And um, we this, have a lot one, in common. This, this, is, this like looks like the cave. Where's that place? The, the one that's not burned very much here. Oh, yeah, okay. oh, K1B is <laughs> worth every year. Yeah, so I mean, it looks a little. K1B. 
Yeah, it makes a like that one right there makes. So me. so read Buffalo for the Broken Heart, and okay. you will then understand what it takes. You know, that's the only reason I do the lottery, by the way. We all need to. <laughs> we all need to. I would buy my. I'd, I'd be Dan O'Brien's neighbor and live happily ever after. There's so many small towns in Kansas that are kind of ghost towns anymore, and I keep thinking, mm -hmm. buy one of those up and do what you want with it. Well, be careful about that. Wes Jackson got to do that with Matt Fieldgreen. Uh -huh. It worked out quite so good. Oh. Well, so if you, if you want bison, what did you say? It worked for a while. You know, there's, Jackson, little ghost towns there's, there's a lot of people who know more about it than I do. I just know the list side of it. Uh, you just kind of want to get away from your area. You could just go buy one of these Oh. Level it out and well, he was getting a lot of press for living off the having people live off the grid at that field grid. I don't know much. People still live there. It's, it's, it's kind of back on the grid as far as Kansas. Right. Yeah. Now you guys made me cry. It's a beautiful. Place. No, we did that by yourself. <laughs> yep. I have a question. It's writing is devastating. I have yes. a question about. Where, how do they round up the cows to sell, and when do they get them at it on October? Do we, you know, okay, here. Okay, so there. you may recall. Were you here for just talk? The bankers. No, we don't round them up. I know. We we lure them in, I know. and okay. once once they're here, they're they're in fenced areas. Right. So, and so when we run them through the corrals, the ones oh, that are going to yeah. be sold get pushed into so a certain town. Decide tent. right then. Right. How much they weigh. He, no, he knows before roundup. And so he sees their ear tags, and he, oh, yeah, and he calls cool. out, and there's a person up on top, and he says, Pen 2, and we open the gate to Pen 2, and it, it, it forms a, a barrier, and they have no choice but to go into Pen so 2. So they're all done in October. It's when they're... I can see how he might lure them in the first time, but the experienced ones, why do they come in the second time? Go back to the data, <laughs> and you're going to see that some of the bulls yeah. didn't That's come smart. in one year, but then yeah. came in the next year because they were sneaky, and they, they figure it out, and they go hide. Instead of the heck with that, I don't want that candy. <laughs> they, it's not worth it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Chris? I was wondering, like, how many of the bison from here would go to Kansas ranches? Like, I know the ice stone. Ranch near here has bison and Dillinger's at Flamingo. And are those Plumley kind of farms in yeah. Plumley, of course? Yeah. Or, you know, I wondered. So it made me wonder how many bison ranches there are in Kansas, and then how much of the the cattle or the bison that are sold from here go to Kansas, and how many, you know, would it mostly be other states? Whoever, whoever is put in the highest bid. Mm -hmm. Ed Dillinger's yeah. my neighbor. Oh, great. <laughs> but there must be a record. It would be. Interesting to know. Yeah, and that's that. That's a Jeff question. <laughs> okay. But but he is not reserving anything for yeah. any certain group. It's just whoever puts it. In, interestingly, in uh, Tompkins County, New York, which is Ithaca, in Finger Lakes, the guy decided to put bison in his pasture, and it's because and it's right next to a public trail, uh -huh. so it's like tourist heaven. I mean, everybody parks and they go go see bison. I can't get over how. How much it hits them, hit them. You can see in these bison, they just they just go crazy. If you leave bison loop tours, yeah, it's you know, and Ken can attest to this. He's leading tours at Maxwell too. He's yeah. Mr. Bison Man. Yeah. The, the bison means so much to so many people. I've had, had a woman last summer from Great Britain who was on BBC all the time and has done done stuff all over Africa, but she had never seen bison. I took her out here. And not here, but the other place, but uh, amazing the, the feeling. And then and the, the two ladies from uh, U.S. Fish and Game that came out from Virginia that mm -hmm. I took out, mm -hmm. they almost, they did cry, but put right in the middle of the herd and they said, we had no idea you could ever get this close. We were there, we just anticipate seeing them off half mile or something. Yeah. yeah. So it can be a very emotional experience. It, it is. It is. It, it's something they've read about all their lives. Especially if you get out there and two bulls are going in it. It's yeah. very cool <laughs> to see that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, that's be. amazing. You know, for years as docents, you know, we, we knew about how they round them up with the red truck and the horn and the treats. Um, and just this last year, uh, Jeff and I were uh, out here with a group of special needs high school students, and they were rounding them up. So it was the coolest thing to stand on the hillside and see that red truck honking its horn, and those bison just up at Pipe Piper. This guy just led them right in. Um, so it was neat to see, and the kids, you know, to be able to talk to the kids about it and get down close to the corral where they're actually, you know, um, 
running, running in, in mm -hmm. to see bison cool. run. Yeah, I can feel that. Yeah. Uh, it's quite the experience. One of the, one of the coolest things I've ever seen of bison is watching them swim across the Yellowstone River. That would be cool. Yeah, that would be yeah. cool. The whole herd watching the calves that can't get up the bank. Whole curves going on. It's just they're amazing. they're neat. They're neat. Mm -hmm. So back to the book. <laughs> guys, that's cool stuff. Back to the book. It's cool stuff. So one thing that that I am planning on doing. Remember, we have an LTR network. We all get together every three years. It's called the All Scientists Meeting at Santa Barbara, and I'm going to give a workshop on how to develop curriculum for book and I would like your two help with if you don't mind to help me develop the, that workshop for them. Well, I'm even going to take you beyond that. I'll bring, get my wife involved. I would love that. Yeah. She's done a lot of curriculum development for I would love that. And then and then then imagine you now have the far reaching effects across the entire network which really would be not just the United mm -hmm. States, but cross world. Mm -hmm. Hey, when you wrote this book, did you write with these uh, next generation science standards in mind? No, because the next generation science standards didn't exist when I wrote okay. that. No. This is a true story. It's a true story. I have, I have it, um, I know where it is at home, I haven't read it yet. So the, this, the upshot is, uh, I was doing a bison loop tour with a, with a docent who needed to learn the gates because she was going to be giving the tour. And <laughs> so it's just she and I. And we saw, and it was September, it was mid-September, and we saw an orange calf. And bison calves are orange when they're born, and they're orange for six weeks. Then their coat turns to brown. So this is mid-September, mm. and we see an orange calf. Okay, when are bison calves typically born? April and May. Okay, so we have we have an orange calf in September. So this tells me that it was probably born at the at the earliest in the late July, sometime in August. So it was a calf that was born in the autumn. Oh. Autumn calf. Now the the ramifications of that would be that this calf doesn't have very long before winter is going to show up. Okay, so how long is it going to nurse? Six months. For about six months. And then, after six months, so if we're thinking like August, when it was born, so August, September, October, November, December, January is when it comes off the milk and it needs to start grazing. Mm -hmm. On what? Yeah. It's the story of that little calf's life. Wow. I'm not going to give the ending away. Figure out the mom on this one. Oh my goodness, yes, because the mom is very famous. Mm -hmm. okay. The mom is a very famous cow who will come right up to your car and stick her head in your car looking for treats. <laughs> <laughs> very famous. They're Seems both like still you out there. Book about her too. They're both oh, still out there. Oh, I just gave away the answer. They're both still out there. Oh, I did. Oh, I did. <laughs> yeah. I was here a couple of years ago, and I was there was a, a calf or young, uh, it was fairly young, uh, animal that was hanging around the, the enclosure, and they were saying that animal doesn't go with the herd; it hangs out here all the time. And um, do you, so that doesn't ring a bell. That this was several my years time. ago. That's uh, been before my time. I was wondering about how common that is, or no? You get the, the cranky, the cranky bulls, and there's yeah. there's been one the last couple of years who's just been by himself. I think this was a cow, and it, it wasn't it wasn't a like a new calf. It was. A little bit older, but it's just hanging out here all the time. So if a, if a cow had, drops a calf, a dead calf, will that cow uh, adopt or will another calf adopt oh, her? Yeah. Did it feel off of because she's got all that milk? Mm -hmm. Well, because there's, you know, she, that calf has its own mama. Mm -hmm. Right. And mama's going to be really protective of her calf. She won't, they won't, the calf yeah, won't go to another one. She's not going to be sharing, she's not going to be sharing her baby with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the other option that is if the mother dies, will another cow adopt the cow? I would, I would expect that, that yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. If, if the opportunity is there, but they're yeah. not going to share them, that's 
What's the the thing? one we saw was born early, so by the time the others are born, she won't have much. She'll be dried up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. She's going to have, yeah. But they'll though, allow cow to, uh, calves to, to suckle on them for two, two generations. Yes. Yeah, I mean, she can, she can nurse ostensibly for a couple of years. Yeah, the, Just to throw out a different thing, in Canada, they still run wild, and the first days they still have to hunt them like they know they would. And so when I used to hear about Buffalo, there was quite a nuisance. They were just a nuisance. And we lost a lot of vehicles to Buffalo because they're running wild. And when they stampede or they run fast, they can ruin a well site. So that's how I used to get reports. <laughs> God, it was, was him Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was just listening to other things. You, you, you come from a different perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are different. I've heard guys say my experiment was ruined because a buffalo laid down on it. And that's water buffalo in the <laughs> rice, <laughs> rice producing areas in the Philippines. We were just, just thinking about that. It's just a different perspective. Yeah. It's an excellent. So, where, where, what part of Canada? In the north, uh, Grand Prairie, in that area. I mean, a lot of First Nations, have been, they just migrate. And we can't even grow because of migratory paths and caribou. I mean, you know, we do have to protect the environment too, so we have to, these animals we have to work around. Yeah. <laughs> That's my key. They, they, they are all migratory up there. Yeah. yeah. Wood Buffalo National mm -hmm. Park is established to protect that population. Yeah. yeah. All right, do we need to take a break? Yeah. Okay, nice. let's take a 10 minute break and come back in here. We will do <laughs> SLTER. Oh, yes, people must be studying that it's all good. Okay. LTER activities. I'm just going to make a list on the board of the SLTERs and again realizing that that is synonymous with the hands-on science. Okay. We have the Hulbert plots. Now another name for this and it's typically the one that we use with the teachers. Hulbert plots. AKA -A, Effects of Fire on the Prairie. Oh, okay. okay, that's one. Then we have the screen macro invertebrates. I'm just going to abbreviate that. We have screen chemistry. Grasshoppers on the prairie. Gall insect sampling. And then finally the plant ID exercise. Not all of these can be done in both the spring and the autumn, so indicating with the red, the Hulbert plots and effects of fire on the prairie can be done in the spring and in the autumn. So S and A, spring and autumn. Stream macros can also be done in the spring and the autumn, as well as stream chemistry. Grasshoppers are autumn only, gall insect sampling, Autumn only. The plant ID exercise can be done in the spring and the autumn. The stream activities <coughs> are further, they, they can be done in both the spring and the autumn, but they both require water in Kings Creek. <laughs> there isn't any other <laughs> maybe. Now, if you're thinking, duh, uh, it's not always guaranteed that we have water in Kings Creek. And in order to do this, the stream macroinvertebrates, we need to have more than just water. We need to have running water because we're using the action of moving water to actually collect the stream macroinvertebrates. So there's that further limitation. So it is a real issue for us this spring because Kings Creek is very low. You do most of your stream work up there, the homestead. We we do most of our stream work actually downstream from the nature trail. Downstream. Downstream from so the nature they're trail. Immediately downstream from the nature trail is a bunch of 
watercress. Is there watercress on downstream when you do Yes. Sampling? You do sampling within view of this nature trail or you try to get away so we that people can well, see you? We do the stream macroinvertebrates within view of the nature trail, and so we have to be really careful about people seeing this down the stream because Absolutely. if they see us, then, then they're going to go. They're going to go, and so we try to make very clear that we are sanctioned and we are doing research there. Okay. So that's where, like, we're in the best. You're, mm -hmm. We're in the best. Really helps because that indicates that this is fully sanctioned. Okay. Okay. Um, so today, we're going to be going over these two, the Hulbert plots and the plant ID exercise, because both of those can be done relatively soon. Uh, for the schoolyard long-term ecological research, these activities are led by Haley and I. And then the docents are further utilized for smaller groups. So for the Hulbert plots, we typically have school groups of, we really don't want very large school groups. I think our biggest is going to, well, I guess we'd go up to 60 on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Half time. Okay. And so just making a note for docent needs, the Hulbert plots, besides Haley and myself, we would need maybe, what, two or three docents total? Yeah, just depending on how many kids. The, the nice part about the Hulbert Plots activity is that it doesn't need just a whole lot of interaction with, with other assistants. You can be there to help them answer questions, but it doesn't take a whole lot of interaction. The ones that use up a whole lot of docents are these stream activities. As, as I say, it chews up docents because it, we need a lot. So they're typically used together. If we are doing stream chemistry, we're also doing stream macroinvertebrates because we split the groups in half. We start off typically with a group of 45 kids and we split them into a group of 23 and a group of 22. <coughs> so split. Do they stay all day for that? And then class in half. How long does it run? Is that like an all day thing? It is in the morning. So it's like an hour and a half. So 9.30 to 11 and 15 ish. It well choreographed. It is a dance. I'm not, I'm, it is a dance. Haley does the stream macros. I do the stream chemistry. With the stream macros, it is having kids work with and but you'll see this this autumn because we'll have you do it. The samplers, server samplers, where the water's going through a net, and the kids are getting rocks and getting um, algae and material off the bottom side of the rocks to physically catch macroinvertebrates and pour them into a bucket. And so it takes a lot of one-on-one -on -one between Haley and the kids. Well, she can only do like maybe what five kids at a time. Yeah. And so there's 15 other kids, 15, 16, or 17 other kids that need to be otherwise distracted until they cycle through. And that's what the docents do, and that's one of the things that Patty does, is you, you basically do a stream explore. Which is a lot of fun. You get to just walk in the creek and go find stuff. Okay. Um, and then she helps to deliver kids to Haley and then takes the other five and brings them back. So it takes, how many you have? You and at least three others? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you use one server sample? No, we've got two. We've got two. And we really couldn't use more because there's not that many. You don't have that no. many. You don't have bigger ripples. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> for a limited area. So for the stream chemistry, that's me, and I break the groups down into groups of four, and there's one docent for each group of four. And they are given a hawk kit where they then work with the docent like Jeff to specifically test the water. So that's going to take another five, because I've got five kid, kids, I take five docents. So within this, we've already used eight docents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, like I said, you choose them up. You choose them up. And that's, that's just the morning. 
Okay, and then and then we come back here and we get this the strain macroinvertebrates out into trays and we have the kids identify them. So we need at least another two docents for the lab part. Oh, you don't identify them in the field? Nope. But bring it back here and use the dissecting scopes. Put them on the screen. So you have uh, redundant uh, chemistry uh, recording? Yes. Yep. We sure do. And that's part of our data nuggets. Okay. And they not only identify the macros, but then they do some tallying and make a decision on whether or not we have a healthy one. Right, because some of the species require, have high water quality demands. And so if we've got certain species that are very demanding, if we've got a lot of them, that tells us that our stream is, is providing what they need, and we've got really healthy water. And so it becomes an assessment. Real science. Real science. That's what I think is so cool about something that's real science. Real science. Yep, and the kids are doing it. Mm -hmm. Grasshoppers on the prairie is another one that utilizes quite a few docents because, again, split in half, split class in half. And I'm going to go back here and say we need eight docents. And for the grasshoppers on the prairie, we are assessing the difference between the grasshopper species and the abundance of the species in the uplands versus the lowlands. And so I take the uplands, Haley takes the lowlands, and then we break the kids up in teams of two, give them each their own transect, which is a straight line to sample along, and they catch grasshoppers along their transect. And they, you utilize about two docents, mm -hmm. and I use to while we're collecting, and then they bring their grasshoppers back and they've got them in kill jars. That's another one they need to realize. So it's for numbers. Just grasshoppers are not going to survive this process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. But the I fact that, that, I that it's it's really good. we have plenty, <laughs> we have plenty yeah. and we're not impacting the population. <laughs> So we bring them back here, and after lunch we do a lab where we identify and count them, and they learn how to mount them. Um, so that's going to be four docents in the morning, and then another two in the afternoon. And there might be some of the same docents, but six. And you compile the data and do some kind of analysis of that? I, I have the data, and I want to incorporate that into an online activity. With it. But the, what we're hoping for is for this putting the onus on the kids to meant, enter yeah. their data. That's what I meant. Oh, into the online actually, data entered, system. Into your database. Okay. And this is what we're hoping to get today. Okay. <laughs> it was supposed to be yesterday, but everyone got busy. But this is what we want in, for all of that data to be combined. Gall insect sampling. We don't do this one very often because the galls are hit and miss and because many of the teachers don't know about it that you guys do. Mm -hmm. And you realize what that one is. That one's easy. Why does that only happen in the autumn? What's that? Why does that only happen in the autumn? The, you can see the galls right now, mm -hmm. but they're soon going to be burned. Um, oh. so, so we're going to be looking for some fresh golden rod with some fresh galls that aren't burned. Okay. Because what would happen is I would have this place staked out and be ready to go and it'd be burned and I'd go out there the next day. And, yeah. Okay. Plant ID exercise. This is what we're going to do next. And the plant ID exercise has specific spring versions and autumn versions. So spring and autumn. In the spring, we do the wildflowers. And in the autumn, we do the grasses. Excellent. I thought you were going to torture them with composites. It would be rare. <laughs> and, and we used to, but then it got later and later, and even they were gone. But we still had grasses, and it turned out to be one of the funnest activities we do. Yeah. Because the kids were learning the grasses and, and being able to the, find them. It was something beyond grass. There's lots of grasses. <laughs> and and they, were, yeah. they were training their eyes to see, whereas it was just a field of grass, it suddenly turned into a field of different grasses and forbs. And it, to see that happen, 
to see that little switch go on, it's very, very quick, and they get really excited about it. Okay, so we are going to do the spring wildflower grass activity, <coughs> at least a portion of it, so you get an idea of what it's like. And this truly is one of the funnest ones to do. Well, they're all fun. <laughs> they're all fun. But this one's, this one's fun, and you don't have to haul boots. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The stream macros and the stream chemistry, see the, yeah. the people laughing are the ones back there. The, the stream macros and the stream chemistry require rubber boots. The rubber boots get put on down at the creek. Well, they, they've got to get down there first. And so that's why we take, we load them up and we unload them and put them in order by size because <laughs> they've got to be able to find their sizes. And then when they're done, we move them back up, put them back on, bring them back here. Clean the mud off. Well, and we have to put them out on the patio because they're wet. Put sticks in them to dry. They're wet and they're muddy. And it's just, it's, it's work intensive for us. But I just, you know, we, we make lemonade and we just call it CrossFit. <laughs> okay. So, if you would look in your binders, It's near the end of the SLTER section. We're looking for the spring wildflower identification data sheet. And let me show you what it looks like. It changes every time. One color is changed. Thirty changed. Yeah. So this. Taken, this is one that was produced specifically for a school group that came on May 6th. So what you see are the flowers that were blooming at that time. And you see that they're listed, and then next to them there's a blank space for uh, their scientific names. May 6th, 2006. Go for it. And so what, what we'll do... Is yours a little different? Mine says April 13th. Yeah, that's King. We have 13, 14. Yeah, that's right. And that's that's better. better. It's a smaller one and includes death candles. That's better. And French macoon. But yours says. True. Mine says. What did she say? I find it intriguing that we're calling it a sedge that can fall apart. That's good. Yeah, that's a flowering plant and it's wild. Yeah, just a couple. True. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's not a grass. It's not a grass. Sedges have edges. What is it? Sedges have edges. Okay, so oh, okay. the specifics of this activity. For this, again, splitting a class in half, because again, this room is small. And so we'll have maybe 23 kids start in here, and I will give them a PowerPoint presentation of photos of the flowers, and I will give them the scientific names and talk about what, what these scientific names mean in Latin, the Latin root words. The other half will be out walking Butterfly Hill, and they will be led by docents, and they will be cutting these flowers. So the docents have the list, they find them, and they have each kid cut like two, two flowers, put them into a paper bag, and they talk about why they use paper and not plastic, because the the plants would would get soggy and rot in, pla in plastic, and they need to dry. And so they're learning the flowers when they're out hiking. Then after, and I think this is about 45 minutes to an hour, there's some transition time, they switch places. So the kids that were in here now go out and hike and collect flowers. And what's interesting about that is they've seen the pictures. Now they get to go out and they're identifying the flowers for the docents. Meanwhile, the kids that were hiked first came in here. They're now recognizing the flowers that they've seen up here. And they're learning the scientific names. Mm -hmm. okay. So they're learning the phenology. And they're learning about scientific names. So let me just run through this a couple of samples. So we start with wild parsley, and I don't know if you guys got that on your list or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so wild parsley. The 
This is what it looks like. We're going to see it here pretty soon. Lomatium funiculaceum. And then I have all the kids say, okay, Lomatium funiculaceum. <laughs> and you would think that the kids would be freaked out by that. I mean, have I told you this, that they're not at all? And there's one reason why. And that's Harry Potter. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's <laughs> I haven't taught since Harry Potter was popular. I should try it again. There you go. Harry Potter brought Latin into the world with these children. And so, it's, and I said that, and I said, Lamatium Pediculatium, and I said that on purpose that way, because it sounds like they're saying a spell. And it's a Harry Potter spell, because all of Harry Potter spells are in Latin. And they're all like, yes! And they completely identify. There's a book that's been published, which is like a field guide to all the books of the uh, Harry Potter. It's, yeah. it's, it's fanciful. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. And, you know, it's very interesting. My wife bought a copy of it, so I had a glance at it. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of a couple of notes about this. It looms March to April. So again, we're going to be seeing this very soon, and it is edible. So once you identify this, make sure you have them, have them taste it. And it tastes kind of like spicy, personally. It's really good. Another thing you can point out, or that I normally point out on this photo, is these guys oh, down here. Okay, and, and so, like I said, what do those look like? What do those remind you of? Because kids are going to look at that and, and, so what do you think, Kelly? What do those remind you of? Clover. 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 It's like shamrocks. Yeah. So this is, this is oxalis, or wood sorrel. And so you can... For the very first slide, you can tell them how they can identify plants by looking at difference in leaves. Some leaves look really fine and feathery, and some leaves look like little hearts. And you've just empowered them, because they're going to go out and they're going to find them. And they now know that there's a difference. Yara, so, so go ahead. If I could, I'd be back up on that, because um, you know, part this parsley is yellow, but parsley, it's, it's just my own discomfort. I'm a biologist today because I almost poisoned myself with poison him mm -hmm. when I was in fourth grade trying to find Queen, Anne, Queen Anne's lace. Yes. And yes. Yes. the local expert had misidentified it. Mm -hmm. And I was going to believe the local expert that I was skeptical enough, early enough in my time that I figured out that he was wrong. So fourth grader telling the local expert he's wrong is something. But my point is, is there's other yellow plants in the parsley family that are extremely poisonous as well. So when we start having students taste things, I think we mm. should I think we should be really careful about yeah. the other ones that can't be confused. What about that cells? It's well, oxalic, oxalic acid itself is uh, a pretty sharp poison if you get too much of it. Oh. It's, it's, so, it's, it, it's such a great taste. You, you yeah. got it. And there's anything that looks like it, it's not going to be, uh, well, three-leaf clover, I mean, it's got cyanide in it, but nobody's going to eat that much. But it, it, you, 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 you have it up there that you taste, so... And there's nothing else that early in the season, but the students aren't going to know that. Well, maybe that, that, that's something that we should say. Don't taste things unless properly identified. Well, and if you go, so you got wild parsley here in the spring, and you go just a little bit north of here, you got yellow parsnip that causes massive blisters in the summer. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's a bright yellow. Umbiliferous, and so yeah, that entire family is really problematic. It's full of really nice edible plants and really incredibly obnoxious and poisonous ones. You know, Ann and I were just talking as experienced docents. Um, we both feel a little uncomfortable with that tasting. Thing. Are you? So, so we talk smell. We okay, we get those leaves and crumple them and smell them and. And even that could cause a reaction if a kid has some kind of a, a, a allergy like to allergy. the touch allergy thing. But there are a lot of docents who feel really comfortable mm -hmm. having kids 
and I, I envy them, their, their certainness. Well, because, I'm certain of because, the identification. It's I'm, just I know what kids do. Yeah. 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 And okay. One thing is I'm too I mean, it'd be like if we took him out to uh, do mushroom hunting and we said, here, you can eat this one, right? And nobody would do that with a kid because they know they'd screw up. So the... They'll screw up, too. Yeah, I don't do it. I'm a mushroom right. player. So, but there are things that are really... I mean, like you could pull a cattail shoot up and eat on that. Nobody would ever mistake that for anything else. Um, the oxalis, piece of cake. So I think you could with certain of them. I just think the ones that they're like the kids, this family I thought is about a problem. what you're saying. That you know, we introduce them to this and say taste it, and then they go to a field and taste something they shouldn't because they yes. think it's what you taught them. That's to right. Taste. I, I I don't want them to taste. Yeah. No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. I, I will tell you, sample like that. I taught kids for years a snake desensitizing exercise. Well, one summer, a kid went out that day and picked up a rattlesnake with his hand because he, for the first time, he'd ever picked a snake up on his own and he got bit. Mm -hmm. Even though I made a point of, no, this is not about learning to pick up snakes. That's how dumb kids are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we talk about the fact that there, uh, even though I don't encourage tasting, that there are so many things out there that are edible and that, you know, the early peoples that were here and, uh, and what they used plants for medicinally and their food value and how all that information is so important to um, to continue to study and to understand. Um, I think there's all lots of good stuff in terms of what the purpose of the plants. I just don't, don't feel comfortable with my own knowledge enough to say, let's all eat this. I'm happy to take that off. No problem. We will. We will. Make sure they're safe. And but crushed. the smell is important to crush sure. a leaf or crush sure. a leaf. Sure. There's so much that you can experience with that. I don't even care if you tell them it's edible, that they need to be run that through their parents or somebody. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh -huh, thank you. Are you coming tomorrow? Yes. I think so, yes. Okay. Yeah, see you then. Okay. Then Yarrow, Achillea millifolium. So what do the words mean? Okay, so millifolium is the easy one on this one. Is folium is referring to the foliage. Milla is referring to the kind of the, the thousands of thousands of little leaves. Like yeah, fern, feathery. feathery but but why milla? Uh, Aquila, I think, comes to Achilles. That that comes from Achilles. And it's a medicinal plant, and it's a European plant as well. So I think that's where it came from. Millifolium reminds me of new food for the pastry. Thousands of leaves. Of but I, I, if I remember right. I, I think I saw something about that associated with the Greek myth and, and the medicinal qualities of it. Naming a species is an is a pleasure that scientists have sometimes, and it will be very anecdotal. You know, it's just, it will. This doesn't necessarily mean. Something. Sometimes you got to be careful because yeah. Linnaeus sometimes got a little. Mm. Yeah, these are old. So. Well, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a pea family plant that's got an interesting. Name. Yeah, you got to yeah. watch out for Linnaeus. It's not just Linnaeus. <laughs> right. <laughs> Naming a new species is always fun. So prairie violet, Viola necrophylla. Uh, apparently, the leaves reminded somebody of what a kidney, yeah. kidney-shaped leaf. <laughs> Nephron. Yeah. Listen to that. And now I'm still over here. She's screaming from here to here. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see nephro? There's another edible. You can take that off. The other thing with violets is they're uh, host plants to uh, the fritillaries. The, the, mm -hmm. the yeah. butterfly fritillaries. The, the fringe, or the regal fritillary. But not, not this, this one, one. it's bird the bird's bird. foot. Yeah. So when you say you'll take off that they're edible, I that might be okay. I think that's so neat to know. It's yes. just I think just I think we are not going to taste them here. here. Not here. 
I took a, I recertified uh, once on a, plant, a class called Prairie Plants Edible and Medicinal, and it was yeah. one of the most interesting things. Uh, Just to, to realize I didn't that taste a single yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, but, there are plants yeah. out there that are edible. I might say they're edible, but we don't do it here. Yeah. Right, right, right. All, all all right. Because we don't know about yeah. all your allergies, and we exactly. don't know that right. everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would just hate for them to not know. Yeah. It's so edible, cool. but we don't do it here because we don't know your allergies. We so don't, maybe just we're not your parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's no, I was that fourth grader that was eating everything I could find when I oh, almost did that, right? My, so, my just, husband does that. He eats berries on, oh my God. See, it, berries. this is to a new Just like you can't take a feather. You can't do it here. Right, right. right. Don't take it off, but figure out a way to. you got to know your boundaries. Yeah. 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 Part of bringing kids you out here is so it's, it's part of growing up. Yeah, that's part of growing up. So he's not grown up. So case in point, <laughs> right. So case in point, here's death camas. Ah. With and it tells you and it's that it's toxic in its name. And even all parts. Which is yeah. critical because some edible plants are different on different parts. Kind like of tomatoes. Part like, the, like the tomato, <laughs> I was about to say. Like a potato. Like a potato. Yeah. Well and, and people wouldn't eat <clears throat> potatoes for years because they thought they'd be toxic. Well they are if they turn green. Yeah. <laughs> or so or tomatoes, yeah. So Toxicoscordia natali, and so this one's named after a botanist named Neville, and you see his name all over the place. And look what it looks like. What, yeah. other, what other thing comes up in Not. the spring with a nice white bunch of flowers? The yeah. other Well, there's another one. Onion. Onion. Onions. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So if you have a really That's very kids, musical. So. Toxicordia. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Toxicordia. <laughs> Toxoscordian metalli, toxic, all parts, long and slender like a lily, and they're they're starting to come up, and we saw them yesterday. Does it have the normal camas root? That, I mean, that's, camas was a very it's, it's a very, point. There, a that's, very a good, that's a good that's good point because there is a camas that's edible. It's uh, out, what kind of and are these plastic. toxic to humans right? or toxic to all animals? Or mm. What's their function? I would, oh well, see now that oh that's such a good point because you're assuming. And, I, and I've had other students assume that too. Well, what good are they? Well, that's because people are human-centric, thinking that a plant's no good unless it's good uh -huh. to humans. So it, it find, just is. You'll yeah. find amanita mushrooms that are very deadly. There are some that are edible, but you'll find amanita mushrooms of the deadly type that are, have been eaten on by deer. And you wonder what happened to them. Uh, so, you know. We don't have time for my having any mushroom stories. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what good are they? Well, be just because it's toxic dust doesn't mean that you know, the bees and the other insects uh -huh. aren't getting nectar from the flowers, or or that it's it's you know it's, it's what its role in nature may be completely different from benefiting you know, anyone. You could actually make a big step forward if you help students get away from the idea that everything has a purpose. Everything fits in. It just, it just things, is. And it interacts with everything else, but to think that it has a purpose implies that everything's tended towards us. Yeah. I think it's really important to get across the idea that nature is not benign. Or that, or that nature doesn't really give a rat's ass about nature. That's right. That's right. So, Okay, so that looks like ragweed to me. That's what I would have called uh -huh. it. Yeah. Those, those look like ragweed. And there's grass in What are you calling yeah. it? I can't hear the first one. Ragweed? Ragweed. ragweed. Yeah, that's what Western ragweed? Ragweed and miracles. It's one of the same yeah. yeah. to me when they're first coming out. Somehow up. we've gotten this idea out there that natural, you know, means... Right. And, and you, guys are, you guys are already figuring out what you're going to talk about when you leave hikes. Yeah. yeah. You talk about this stuff and say, all right, so what do you know about this plant? Would you eat this plant? I was really excited when I first saw this the plant. The first word gives a clue. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. what it is. So I was thinking that. the camera <laughs> southwest. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, oh good, I've got another root plant I can eat, but nope. Okay, so I'm just going to show you very quickly the rest of the slides because mm -hmm. we're quickly running out of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So just to see what's coming up, because these are the flowers that we will be seeing maybe tomorrow. So here's the ground plum. Wedge leaf drop a tiny little plant. Oh, really? Teensy tiny. Oh, I shouldn't have shown. I can't put this one up now on Facebook. It's cute. No. 
I have been looking for that for so many years. I can show you exactly where it is. Hmm. Okay, it's, it's, I will bring my Aldo Leopold quote. <laughs> it's, it's right here at the edge. It's by the, the propane tank. Okay. Right along that edge. Red button? No, I don't. Have, yeah. Which is a big one. I'm just getting the yeah. up. There's our Johnny jump up with the yellow in the middle. They'd be tiny. Oh, that one is in. Oh, what's the bio? Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, another bio. Johnny jump up. Because it, it just kind of shows up. Okay. It, very quickly. It, it shows up a lot in lawns, too. It, it will be after in our lawn. I'm going to go to the store. Yeah. Don't yeah. you want to let the other one? Slender Fumort. This will be over by where the sun photometer used to be. You can remember where we pointed that out yesterday. Spot where an instrument was going. Where the instrument pads was still there. The pad's still there, and the slender fumarts will be there too. So All right, so this one. Ah, this, one. this was the discussion that was the, this one. All right. The, uh, All right. <laughs> this depends on the age. Okay. So. If you've got it's, and it's sad, isn't it? <laughs> if you've got junior high kids and you want to keep their attention, I turn this into kitty toes. Yeah, yeah. I turn this into kitty toes, and it'll be kitty toes on the sheet, and I tell the docents, and then they roll their eyes at me, and I say, yeah, you're, gonna go, go, "You're gonna appreciate this." It turns into kitty toes because they're just they're just soft little fuzzy mm -hmm. flowers. So it's it's a legacy of like the Victorian age. Yeah. And we'll find those. Okay. Neither, okay. We go back. Neither male or female. Okay. So so flowers are that monoecious means one house. Okay. Mono is one. Ecious is house. So the the flowers are either boy flowers or girl flowers. Uh -huh. And so if you've got yourself a magnifying lens, you can get down there and see if they have stamens or if they have pistols. Oh. But you're going to have to be laying on the ground because they're so pretty tiny. Right. They're about this tall. You just, <laughs> uh, I, I was, you know, I've never owned a hand lens. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, like you're going to want one. So we're going to need one. You're gonna, you can get yeah. without one, but you're going to want one. They sell on Hobby Lobby, right. pretty good ones there. Uh -huh. I ordered some Russian ones that were spectacular. <laughs> of course. Uh, all right, so what's this? Oh, that's the one we're not supposed to say. Parsley. 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 So this is what the kids are getting. What's this? Kitty toes. Kitty toes. Cat toes. Cat toes. What's this one? A yarrow. yarrow. Or Western yarrow, mm -hmm. if we're going to be specific. But yarrow. How about this one? Mm -hmm. I yes. Was, I was talking about them. I can't remember. This is slender humor. Slender humor. So wart so, is an old so English term meaning plant. What's, what's <laughs> interesting about this, I think it's also important. Some people wonder why do you worry about Latin names. They're supposed to be, that's an easier way to communicate with science. Yeah. But some of the common names are so awful, you might as well just learn them. The scientific name, because Coriolis is, is uh, you know, a variety of plant you buy at, the, at, at a greenhouse. So. Bleeding heart. Yeah. Dutchman's bridges. Jeff mentioned the other day that there are common that names that for plants, plants that actually have several different plant and, and species. Well, we got into one of our deals where I messed up a common name. So, yeah. so how common does, names are a train wreck. If you're a scientist, it just cuts to the chase. And it doesn't. You don't have scientific names that say pussy toes. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> Maybe. I got a few others. That, that, yeah. Well, let us know. Here. Oh, it's bad. Phallus yeah. mushrooms. Yes. Well, but uh, how, there's how that wart. <laughs> what? How does that wart relate to the wart when you brew beer? That's also uh -huh. called wart. Oh, uh, that's a different deal. <laughs> but so, so that that word, the old word meaning. That word means, means, means plant. I, just mean, I don't know. I, well, I did and look hops, at that recently and I can't remember what it is. Hops, yeah. I mean, I hops is the kind of plant. Well, hops is, but, but after you, the wort is what's left. It's yeah. Yeah. Away. After, after you brew it, it's, it's, it's the, the mash in the bottom of the kettle. All right, what's this? Some kind of violet. Uh, very, very violet. Very violet. It's going to have more of a heart shaped leaf. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, what was the scientific name on that? Viola. Nephrophila. Nephro. 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 Are some of those bluer than that? 
So that sure. Oh yeah, you're going to have variation in the in the plot in the petal color. Sure, but the, it's the heart shaped leaf that's yeah. the giveaway. What's this? Drava. Yeah, wedge leaf drava, and it's this isn't you don't see the leaves. the The leaves are little, and they do have a, a wedge, the central that's uh, a, central vein. What's extending from inside the flower? So it? that's the the fruit that's starting to yeah. develop. Oh, you mean this right here? Yeah. It's not the pistil, so I'm thinking that's the fruit that's starting to develop yeah. out of the flower. Yeah. And here. Elongating. It's elongated. Yeah. Elongated. How tall is Wesley Grover? Hey, are we likely to see any orchids? Yes. In, In September. In September, we have a spot. There's two okay. three spots. What's this? Yeah. Right here. That's what we saw. We saw it growing yesterday. Red, 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 red. Jump up. Blue. 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 Not just the. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, you might see this one tomorrow. Uh, and that is a stragglers. All right. When you say see them tomorrow, you're not talking about the bloom. I am talking about, about the bloom really, really already. Yeah. I'll be done. Yeah. Wow. This is kind of why we're waiting for okay. pushing the hype till tomorrow because I want to increase our chances of seeing the flower. Well. <coughs> I didn't know where to look for these problems, right? So they can come back year after year. Oh, magnifying glass and yeah. that book. They're on the nature trails. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. What right. are these? We're, we're running short on time. My goodness. Right. We're going to get more questions uh, as long as we have time. I don't know that we're going to have time to do the plant ID exercise okay. now that we ran around and got it done. Um, so, one of the things that we do after the PowerPoint is the we give the kids one of the previously pressed flowers. So previously pressed. Okay. Haley and I had gone out like the week before and cut samples of these blooms and then we pressed them in a plant press. And so the kids learn what a plant press is and how it works. And then, this is one of the few examples of where the kids get something to take home. Oh, right. They get to take this home. And so they glue, first of all, they figure out what, what it is. So what is this? Maybe no, the, uh, oh, we just what saw the conversation took so long about is poison. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is this yeah. death? This is death canvas. Is this is death. still deadly when it's... Yeah, but Don't I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so and then you you see the equipment that's out. Yeah. So what they do is they will glue, they will trim it as needed. You can just live in here and dry. And they will glue their specimen onto this herbarium card. Then they will fill out a label with the common name and the scientific name, mm -hmm. and with their names and the dates, glue that on. To the card. Yeah, and that's the glue is in the, the glue. Oh, and the, the <laughs> Using the Q-tips mm -hmm. and the glue in the petri dish. So there's putting a dot in each corner. They don't need to put any more than just a single dot. <laughs> each corner. And then whoops. And a couple of dots on here. The Q-tips are there for a reason. They work really well. Okay, glue that on. And then to protect it, you've got contact paper. This is the hardest part. <laughs> so they learn what a dog ear is. Mm -hmm. They make a dog ear bend, and they just pull it back. They can separate. Um, and it seals on. And then they lay that down with the sticky side up, take their card, put it down in the very middle. Okay. And you fold, fold, take the scissors, trim, trim, flat. Okay. What age group are you doing? Any, any. They all have fun. They all have a ball. Cool. That's really cool. nice. And they can take this home. 
So how did they identify the plant just from your slideshow? I from and going out. out. Yep. So they There's know. only a few that are going to be available in any given week, so you don't have to know all 700. It's a little harder without leaves. What's that? It's a little harder without leaves. It's, it's, well, and, and we, put, it's, we put books out, Yeah. Mm -hmm. and we also have some other, we have some um, laminated sheets with colored photos and names. So they've got it narrowed down. Mm -hmm. I tell them it's one of these. Mm -hmm. And they've got it narrowed down, and they can talk amongst themselves, and we, we let them know. Sure. So you do those activities in this room? Yes. Right here. So a smaller group, not like it's it's seven. it's half the class, so it's like twenty five kids, and oh then gosh, that's a lot and then we just put them all in one bag to give to the teacher. Okay. But they have the kids' they names on them, so when they get back, they get to give them back. Oh. So you got back. four tables here with six chairs at each, I guess. 20. Yep. 24. Do you press the contact paper down differently or just leave it like that? I would have done a better job. You were in her, I know. But I just was curious about what the kids, what the kids were. Gonna it comes in all different permutations. Mm -hmm. the, the hardest part for them is trimming the corners. They want to trim the, uh, the wrong way, so you've got to trim towards the center. Yeah. So you have a little flap. Of all the things that cool. screws them up, fine, fine. that little You're flap screws them up. What did you call the board? The board is it a special? Is it treated? No, but I'm that, that that do really is, fast, I get that from Staples, and that's like a, a heavy it's poster board. board. It's, it's like it just. It, it's not. It's not so. You called it something like. It, there's no special name. Oh, herbarium card. Herbarium card. I called it herbarium card. What are you grabbing herbarium sheet here? Herbarium specimen. Because you can make herbarium cards that have the roots and have the full leaves, and you, you would keep them in an herbarium as specimens. They're there. And when they're uh, bigger than fit on now, they'll bend them. They'll be bent, right. Most of them will be bent. And, and what you really want is the full plant. And so we have herbarium specimens from Lewis and Clover. I mean, not us, but like at Harvard. It's amazing how well they keep it. In my work, and I've worked on a disease of grass plants, so rice and wheat, the main things we've focused on. But you can snip off a diseased leaf, tape it down with scotch tape is what we usually yeah. use and keep them forever. As long as you keep them dark, the leaf is still green, and you can look at it and see exactly what the disease symptoms were like. Mm -hmm. And uh, that amazed me when I got into no, the that's with the mosses, you can actually revive. <laughs> you can bring them back to life. Yeah. So, <laughs> actually, you get fungus out of these leaves when they're very old. If you're really interested in the plants of Kanza, we have herbarium specimens in here. And so, come on up. <laughs> I think I know someone who probably know very well, Dave Sampson. Oh, yes. Doesn't he a character? He definitely is. 
I work with Dave for a number of years. We're not burning with him last year. Yeah, he's a neighbor, and we do a lot of music together. But I've noticed, you know, that he's got an extremely musical. He always sense. has been, but he's still. I didn't know that when I was working. With him. Oh, yeah. Well, he. <laughs> I, so. And and George um, Larue, who has bison and out uh, this also. Anyway, the, those guys are. I mean, Dave is probably at the top of unique. He must have been. He was here at the beginning when you were. Yes. He came a little bit later. Let's see when did he. Well, in the, he said Holbert was like hired him. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, oh, you did. I, Excuse me. I'm sorry. It's okay. Lloyd probably had seven papers. Um, probably mid '80s. No, he was here before then. He, I talked, I talked to him just recently, okay. and uh, he was still, a, he was still a student at Case State. I mean, he was an old student because he yeah. um, Well, I know he. Well, he. He, he had, said seventy. That could be. You know, it was about 1980 when the LTER project started. And I know he's worked with one of the researchers there for a year at okay. least. And then okay, maybe that's went to um, facilities at the roller. Yeah. But wanted to come back yeah, that's out here, so we had a position. There's an insult question in there as well. Well, I made sure I wrote your name down so that. Okay, guys, go ahead and have a seat. We've got one other thing to say. Hey! Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I thought I had my Hilbert plots map. Do you want them with you? I've got All of my sheets. Ah, there they are. I see them. I got them, Haley. Okay. Okay, if you would refer to, in your book, the Hulbert plots, fire demonstration plots, which is at the very beginning, you've got the general project description, and then the next page is the Hulbert fire demonstration plots. And the Hulbert fire demonstration plots are just all laid out in that first page, but it is the second page that I want you to take a look at, which is the map. Oh, it's the third page. Okay, so this is on this one. This is one. The last two. one, there you go. It should be the next one. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now you can visualize where we were yesterday. Are you not finding it? From the SLTR. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Tell, me where the, tell me where this building is. Okay, so, so the, wait, wait, wait. Let's just oh. do this all together. <laughs> do this all together rather than piecemeal. Okay, so the bottom of the page is north. Okay. The top of the page is south. We, when we were standing there yesterday, Actually, it's the other way around. The top of the page is north, the bottom of the page is south. Sorry. When we were standing there yesterday, we were at the bottom right-hand corner. We were at the bottom right-hand corner with Patrick yesterday. We were between C11 and D11. That's where we started. And we walked down. We walked down. Let's just do this all together, guys. We walked down this alleyway here, and then we went down the slope down here. So this is the top of the slope. The right side of the, of the sheet is the top of the hill, and then we go down the hill as we go towards the left side of the sheet. So row D is the top of the hill. Row C is the side of the slope. Row B is towards the bottom of the slope, and then row A is at the bottom. So looking at this, row D is going to have the thinnest soil, row A is going to have the thickest soil and the most moisture. If you take a look at each of these plots, they're 10 meters by 25 meters in size. There's 48 of them. Each row has the same plots. So each row is going to have, if you take a look at the bottom of row D, burn yearly early spring, row C is going to have a burn yearly 
early spring. Which is C6. 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 Yeah. And then <laughs> row B is going to have a burn yearly early spring. And then row A is going to have a burn yearly early spring. Every row has the same. They're all replicated. Only okay? the difference is soil. And water. 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 So all of them are going to have, just looking at row D, a burn yearly early spring, a four year burn, 1983 <coughs> plus four, unburned, a four year burn, 1982 plus four, four year burn, 1984 plus four, burn yearly November, burn yearly late spring, burn even years, burn odd years, burn four years, 1981 plus four, and burn four years November. Are there soil moisture sensors in here? It's just, just land that's mowed around the edges. Casual observation. Why do you say that? I don't know if you're getting this. I don't know much about not uh, even uh, mowing <laughs> and feeding versus grazing and burning. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that's what those plots are simulating. They are, they are no longer. You, you can't even see them there. Uh, they're, they're no longer there. And so it was looking at, uh, you know, when you burn, you remove a certain amount of nitrogen just with the, the smoke. And with haying, you don't. It stays back in there. So ostensibly, you should have more nitrogen than the ones that are hay rather than burned. Mm -hmm. But I think that they didn't see enough of a significant difference. So that's been abandoned. Was part of the goal of this to figure out what might be going on with the larger watersheds I mean, to help with the, planning the, that? The goal of this was to provide an easy public visual so it's public of the effects of, of fire yeah. on the prairie. You could just walk out there and boom, you could see it. So it's educational and not research. Right. Basically. It's not research, it's education. The other thing that it does is it, that's in the Lord's early research, it put a lot of these different type of experimental plots close together on the same and then the slopes and soil depth as opposed to quarter mile, half a mile apart out of the prairie. So it seems Maybe to be some yeah. research. Yeah. Yeah. There was research in the real estate. Yeah. Okay. So there's a go up on the north no, we'll side of the north side. You can stop there and look out there and show the kids. Here's what all the different ones look like. Don't stick it away. Just keep it out. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that my D3 plot was burned last year. I want to give you another example before you do yours. B10 is my other example. B10, is that in the same row? I'm going down the hill. So B10 is what? Burn yearly. Burn yearly. Early spring. Okay, so you guys do yours now. You guys do know yours. Look to see what you've been assigned. Find it on the map and write it on your sheets. Early so write it down on your sheets. Yearly. Nothing's been burning out there yet. Yeah, we have the winter burns. What's that? Oh, okay. Okay. They're both burning. Okay, start off here. Okay, good. Yeah. You doing burn crew? So you on the top of the. Somebody dropped off, so open up the spots. Plug me in. Excellent. Yeah. 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 These have been around for 30, almost 40 years. Almost 40 years. 212, 216. Okay, you got that established? You got one of those? Okay, now recall what you saw yesterday. Were some of those plots completely engulfed with dogwood? Yep. Do you recall which plots were completely engulfed with dogwood? Well, the 20 year okay, so some of the 20 years. A lot of the four year burns. Did any of you get assigned a four year burn? Yes. Yes. We got 85. Not only did we get assigned a four year burn, we got one So we got one that we can't walk through. We got assigned one that was being sampled for the C4 and C3, if I remember. So normally, what I will do. Ah. Yeah, we got assigned to 85, 19. Okay. So normally, I would not give a four year burn as an assignment. I would give an annual burn or a biennial burn. Why? Because I don't want kids walking through dogwood. They don't want to walk through dogwood. Again, we have to stand back and say, what is the central tenet of coming out here that they have fun? And walking through dogwood equals no fun. Mm. Impossible, I think. Well, you know, these are kids. kids. So it's, all, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's not pleasant. So, so typically you would get an annual burn and a biennial burn. Sometimes you might get an annual burn at the bottom of the hill versus an annual burn at the top of the hill, but nobody gets the exact same thing. Okay. So I've got like my master sheet to make sure that I try to keep track of who's got what. You did that for us? Oh, I did this for another class. Okay. This is. No, that's one of the No, that's a previous class. So, we did 24. So, when they get out there, you may not remember this, but the signs will tell you what the treatment is. They'll say burned annually in the spring. They do not give you the code. For example, mine is going to say burned odd years, but it's not going to say D3. So another part of this is finding the correct plot. And you think the kids always find their correct plots. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like a scavenger hunt. You know, they've got to find their correct plots. And then they've got to kind of make observations of you know, where they are on the slope and make predictions about what they're going to get, what they're going to see. Uh, could you grab me a flag and a quadrant? Mm -hmm. When they come up here, I explain all this to them, and I have them get in two pairs. And usually we're at the picnic tables, so they can write on the picnic tables. And give them pencils and have them fill out the data sheet with their school, teacher, <coughs> their names, the date. Thank you, ma'am. Perfect. Thank you. And a soil thermometer. Excellent. And a soil thermometer. Okay. So then we walk over to the Holbert plots. I'm doing this here because we're running out of time. So they, they are then shown what they will do once they find the plots. Each student is going to take 
a count of the numbers of grasses, the numbers of forbs, and the numbers of wooded vegetation, woody stems, within this area. Now, a quadrat typically doesn't look like this. Quadrat is usually a meter squared. And it's usually made out of PVC pipe. We don't have any, so we're using, we're making do with these. These just look like big croquet wickets. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And so what they will do is each student, one at a time, will pick a side of their of their plot. Doesn't matter which side. Typically you want to go against the wind. Because if you go with the wind, your flag will go past you and and then we'll go. You want to go against the wind, throw the flag behind them. Because if you go with the wind, it'll go the flag will go forward. Carol's what are, you, what are you saying again? Say it again. Okay, so you are at your you are at I'm your spot. You're I'm at your spot. Mm -hmm. You need to find randomly determine a spot. Oh, um, uh, you need to randomly determine a spot within your plot to sample your grasses, forbs, and woody plants. Because if you go in and just pick the best spot that you like, then that's not it's not going to be random determination. To randomly define, find your spot, you need to throw your flag. Oh, and you turn I around understand. and throw the flag, and wherever it lands, you, it's going to land flat. You bring it up, push it down, and then you put your quadrat, and it's going to be, there's some, going to be some subjectivity here. But put the flag in the middle, and we always do the same with the flag in the middle, and the quadrat goes around the flag. Then you need to work the plants so that they, the origin of the stems, the ones that originate outside the frame, kind of bent out that way, and the ones that originate inside the frame. And then you start at a corner and you count the number of green stems for grasses, forbs, woodies, for the entire frame. Wow. It's a lot less than you think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a lot less than you think because we're just going with the green and it really is a lot easier if they get a plot that's been burned recently. <laughs> and it's like, this is the best thing ever. Because we're looking at the effects of fire on the presence and absence of certain kinds of plants. So ostensibly, the hypothesis is that the plots with the higher fire frequency will have a higher number of grasses. And the plots with the lower or with the less frequent fire frequency will have a higher number of forbs. So we start, everyone understands that hypothesis. And then we go out, and then each kid does a sample. Okay. So once this person's done, they switch places. Meanwhile, while this one's counting, the other partner is recording. And they're making hash marks in each of those boxes. So it's one, two, three, four, five grasses per box, and then the next box. Oh, okay. So it's a total of five hash marks per box. So they can easily sum them up. So it's the number of grasses that the first researcher got and the number of grasses that the second researcher got. Add them up. Number of forbs, for one and two. Number of woody plants, one and two. Add them up, get a total, and they get a percentage. What percentage? And we give them calculators, but they all use their phones. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> we get that look. So, so each of the research will look in the same area, count the same. They will each throw their flag. Okay. It'll be in two different, two different areas okay. of that same plot. Mm -hmm. They throw the flag, they count the number of grasses, forbs, mm -hmm. and woodies. Oh, good. In that one spot, and then they switch places. Well, oh, they count both spots twice. They so, or, or okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Each, so this would be kid number one. Uh -huh. Okay, and then kid number two throws a flag, yeah. gets a different spot. Oh, a different same plot. Okay, yeah, yeah. So they work together to count. Oh, that's one yeah. times one right. So right. right. Yeah, that's so right. Right. So so both. So it's they both. Yeah. That's why. You, and this one, this just one they each counted their own spot within a plot. Then they go to the second plot mm -hmm. and do it again. Okay. So you can imagine why they're not doing the four-year plots. 
Right. This would go right yeah. in the middle of the dog. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, too hard. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine why you're not using a one square foot of coal pipe. The speeds it up a little bit. Why are there columns under each one of those? Yeah. And apparently, it's to take the temperature. Why are there columns? Yeah. Well, that's the only one. That's just room. Just room to put all your tickets in. So you say put five tick marks in the box and move to the next cell on this table. Right, five per cell. Just five per cell. Five per cell, and that, that enables easy counting. Right. Because speed is, is essential at the end of this. So five tick marks per cell. Oh, okay, there we go. Five tick marks per cell. Got it. And then additionally, you see that we're taking the soil temperature. So you can go one, 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 just go one, bring it down, then go one, two, three, four, five. And one, one, just the tick mark. Yeah, tick mark, yeah. Just visually, the kids are good. Yep. So here's your. Actually, it's good for them to figure out how to organize this work. Too. It's but, true, yeah. yeah. That's a good it's interesting experience. But Even kindergarten. You know, I, do you recommend yeah. them to try to first count yeah. all the grasses and then count yeah. the forbs? Yeah. 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 I, I think that would be There's one little way to get a cat, so they figure it out. Yeah. And they're taking the soil temperature because which plot should be should have the warmer soil, the ones that are annually burned or the ones that are biennially burned? Well, I know because I stuck my finger in the ground yeah. yesterday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we, we collect data on that Yeah. to see if that supports it or if the data they support it. So at the total depth of the soil thermometer or at, what, at smaller, shorter? About, about half submersion, so... Imagine it's these plots are probably not too hard to push it down. Very easy. Yeah. Very it is easy. there's a big difference between the top two inches and the bottom four inches. Yep. It's about half. I've been on farmers' fields where you can't get the soil moisture prone. Yeah. <laughs> the and then they come back better. and we tally it all up and we get the, we put the data up and then we the teacher usually takes a photo of it. How many years of data do you have? A lot. So you put it together? No. <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need, I need, we, need, we need clones for people who want to do this. Good grief. Grass students. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, got, I've got piles of data that I'm just waiting for somebody to come and do something with it. But again, we're trying to address that by having the kids put it online. I've been in the field with a seedsman who's up near Republic. He grows lots of different kinds of seed for selling. And he always keeps track of the stand density for these different things. And he has a hula hoop. He has yes. 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 And the hula hoop goes sailing out in the field wherever it lands. He goes and counts everything inside the hula hoop. <laughs> and um, that's, keeps that's track of that to, acceptable. You know, to measure uh, how productive his fields are from one year to the next. Year. So, since you, how long? So, you've been doing this for a while, so it's relatively standardized. Yes. Um, you could conceivably change it to a truly random sample by having them pick random numbers and take a measuring stick out there and do a grid just about it's probably it's that bad. Just throw in that flag in the air. I mean the flag in the air is not going to be a random. You can get little, little, little. They aim. I know they do. They're totally aiming away from the dogwood. <laughs> there's there's That's, subjectivity. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Be interested in hearing thoughts on it. Um, yeah, you know, in my research methods class, we always had to deal with that. So Subjectivity. But that becomes a good sampler topic for discussion. Bias. You know, yeah. to witness that. Yes. Well, we talk about that. We talk yeah. about sampler bias, right. and we we address it out there and say, okay, yes. I see that you are throwing it this way because the dog was over here. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a word for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they learn it. It's part of the deal. This is good. Yes. Okay. So tomorrow we're going to meet in here and we're going to talk about what what one does when one leads a nature trail hike and what how we start and the what you consider. Um, because what's going to happen tomorrow is that we're going to have a bunch of the experienced docents come and the experienced docents love nothing else mm -hmm. but to impart their wisdom. Onto you, and so they're gonna they're gonna pull you away, and I'm gonna be constantly trying to pull you back in, and so 
I need to at least get a couple of, of things in first before they get a hold of you. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's just the that's just the way it works. So we're in here first. Is there a little code? Chad is the one I'm worried about. So, <laughs> he's so fast. He's, well, he loves to impart wisdom, and so there's wisdom to be imparted, and so you learn from that. But there's things that I need to tell you first that make sure that everybody knows. Otherwise, I have no clue what, what you're getting. And so we're going to start there and then realize that I, I will be trying to keep you guys together with me as much as possible. So be cognizant of that and try to stay with me. Are we walking in burned? Yes. So maybe don't Whatever. You're going to be walking. Well, it's, it's gravel. gravel. It's it's gravel. gravel. We're not going off the trail, really. Um, not much. It's. I've never. I've never really experienced any damage to it. So. Come on. It's, it's very dry, powdery, and we're going to be walking in the in the gravel, but maybe get off and might bring a thermometer and see what it says and do some fun stuff. But we, other than our first half hour here, we're going to be outside hiking tomorrow. And it should be a high of 63. So it oh, oh yep. And we'll need our sunscreen. <laughs> well, that's, a good, that's a good thought. All right, any questions? Oh, I've been assuming that we have to make sure you talk about tick safety. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because you know, if you stay on the trail, you really don't get right. into but, ticks. But like the holder plots. Mm -hmm. The Hulbert plots you do. The Hulbert plots are basically rolling on the ground. And so, yes, tick safety is something that we do address. Okay. 